Precious Father, we thank you tonight. We give you all the glory and honor for the privilege to gather together at your summon and at your instance. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of fellowship. Thank you for the fellowship of one another. Thank you, Lord, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit that makes fellowship meaningful, purposeful, impactful, and gracious. We thank you because again tonight, you have afforded us the opportunity to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for open heaven over this meeting. Thank you for everyone that is partaking in this fellowship online, on ground. Thank you for the things you have in store for our Bible studies this new year. Thank you, Lord, for taking us from levels to levels, from stage to stage, in knowledge and in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We return all the glory to you tonight. Father, be thou exalted in Jesus' name. We're looking up to you, great Holy Spirit, that you will take over this meeting. You will mantle upon everyone connecting to this meeting. You will draw men to Jesus. You will feed us, help us, strengthen us, empower us by your word, and strengthen our spirit. You will educate us about God's plan and agenda for the last days, that we will profit as a result of this fellowship tonight. Great Holy Spirit, to draw men to yourself. Draw men to Jesus. Bring glory to Jesus again and establish the counsels of the Father. We receive the eye that sees the things that God is showing us. We receive the ears that hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. We receive the heart that understand and obey. Thank you, Father. Be free among us. No other influence is allowed here. Let the Holy Ghost have complete influence and dominance in this place. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, we pray. Let me welcome you formally to Bible study this year. This is the first Bible study in 2023. And I believe it's going to be a time of a refreshing in the presence of the Father. We're trusting that God will help us in this journey this year as we seek to know more about God about his word, I am confident in the Holy Spirit that you will be empowered, strengthened, blessed, built up, and established in the purpose of God in the name of Jesus. Like I say every time that you should take yourself serious because God is taking us serious. And I'm praying that you will come under the anointing for consistency this year to be consistent in attendance and attention to the word of God as the Holy Ghost take us through journey in the book of Revelation in the name of Jesus. As a result of this series, you will be strengthened and better equipped as one of the last days believer. And God is going to depend upon you in the name of Jesus. Tonight, we will continue with our study series in the book of Revelation. Uh, we started towards the end of last year to look at the book of Revelation I mean, looking at it one after the other, verse by verse, as we study with the help of the Holy Spirit, 
we have done 10 different teachings in the book of Revelation chapter 1 and we are still in verse 7. And we are going to pick it up from verse 7 tonight. So tonight's teaching will be number 11. So let's look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. We are dealing with the certainty of Christ's second coming. Part 3. Part 3. If you remember, as you go through your notes, you discover that we have done part 1. In the part 1, our focus was to look at the certainty of Christ's second coming. The fact that he's coming in the clouds as recorded by the scripture, is certain. And it's important for us to know that so that our preparation can be informed by biblical revelation. A lot of people have wrong mindset when it comes to the second coming of Christ. Most people have an unbiblical, unscriptural rationalization and conclusion concerning the second coming. They said, well, it's not necessarily going to appear in the sky. That it is when you die that your own Christ has come. Or, I mean, they, or, or they have different rationalization as to the fact that it's not going to appear in the sky. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible told us it's going to appear in the sky. And it's not going to be outside what the word of God has said. So, that we need that certainty to know that he's going to come. Is the trumpet will sound and he will appear in the sky and the whole world will see him. That's how the Bible puts it. And that's how it's going to happen. Because the scripture cannot be broken. And we need that understanding of the fact that the second coming of Jesus is certain. One, so that we can know the kind of life we should be living as believers of the last days. So that we can be living our life prepared. Because it can happen any time. We are closer to it than before. So we must be prepared. Number two, it's important for us so that nobody will be able to deceive us. Because in the last days, many teachings of human opinion, human philosophy are flying around. Many wrong teachings full of errors that are not scriptural are running around. And the devil is deceiving a lot of people. But our own faith, our own expectation must be based strictly on what the Bible says. That's why we need to know it. So we will not be a victim of deception, which is a powerful weapon in the hand of the devil in the last days. So we, when I was taking the first part of this teaching, the certainty of Christ's second coming, I went into different biblical statistics, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, to prove to you clearly that it is certain that Jesus is going to come back. And once you settle that in your heart, then the next thing is to begin to live your life prepared and getting ready for him. Don't be unduly attached to the things of the world. We must use the things of the world to pursue the purpose of God as long as it lasts. But we must not be unduly attached to them because all of them will still be destroyed. Jesus is going to come back. And if we are still alive, we are going to be caught up with him in the sky. And those that are dead will also be caught up with him in the sky. And I told you that there is no second batch of rapture. The best thing is to live our life every day in preparation 
in readiness for the event that is global, the event that is universal, and the event that is going to happen. Did you get that now? The second part of this teaching, that is the certainty of Christ's second coming, part two, my focus was basically on the glory of Christ's second coming. The glory of Christ's second coming. What we were saying there, what we thought in that teaching is that Jesus' second coming is going to be glorious as unlike his first coming. His first coming was not glorious, so to say, <laughs> because he came as a servant. He came as a savior. He was born in a poorly rodent-infested, smelly manger. You get what I'm saying now? That no, no, nobody even expects that somebody of Jesus' status as the savior of the world was born there. But that was where he was born. And you get that was why they didn't take him for a king. They thought that at least if he's going to, if he's really a king, he should be born in the palace. But that's not the plan of God. The plan of God is that a savior will be born. It's not about where he will be born. It's about why he will be born. And that why is he will save his people from their sin. And all through his life, all through his ministry, he was a servant. He was a savior. I mean, dying and using his life, shedding his blood to ransom many people. But his second coming, he will be coming as a king. It will be glorious. It will come with all the heavens, pomp, and pageantry. His coming will be full of glory. I mean, the second coming. Is that okay? And he's coming to judge those who did not accept him. So, today, I'm taking the last part of verse 7. So, I'm looking at the certainty of Christ's second coming, part 3. And what I'm focusing on today is gladness and gloominess at Christ's second coming. Gladness and gloominess at Christ's second coming. When Christ comes again, there will be mixed feelings. Some people, it will be a day of gladness. These are the people that have believed, that have accepted Jesus as their Savior and Lord and have served Him all through their life. It will be gladness. The believers will be raptured. It will be a time of reunion with their Savior and Lord. It will be a time of joy for the believers. That's why I said gladness. And then there shall also be gloominess for some other people. Those that didn't accept him. Those rebellious, stubborn sinners who despise the redemption of Jesus. Who did not give him their lives who did not accept him as their Savior and Lord, they, it will be a day of sorrow for them. It will be a day of gloominess. So, at the return of Jesus Christ the second time, there will be a mixed feeling. Some will be glad. Some, it will be a day of gloominess. That's the focus I'm dealing with tonight. Gladness and what? Gloominess at Christ's second coming. Now, let's read Revelation chapter 1. I'm reading verse 7. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, a comet with clouds, and every eye shall see him. I want you to underline that statement. Every eye. Those in the remotest village, where there is no signal, they will see him. It's not going to be a secret event. It's going to be a global event. The glory orchestrated by that event will be so much that everybody everywhere will see him. The dazzling lights, 
the shining stars, the trumpet sound that we herald is coming, the golden appearances will be so visible that everybody in the world will see. It's coming with, in a dazzling light, will light up the whole parts of the world. Both land, sea, air, everywhere. It will be an event that nobody will be able to deny. It's going to be noticed. It's going to be known all over the world. No matter how remote the place is, they won't need to read it in the news. Because the word of God is true. The Bible says, and every eye shall see him. Somebody say, every eye, and every eye shall see him. And then the Bible went on further to say, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, a amen. Every eye will see him, and part of the eye that will see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail before him. Wail means they will mourn. They will mourn before him. They shall wail before him. Now, I'm going to share with you four different uh, points, uh, four different truths in this study tonight. So, number one, the first thing I want you to know is that the first coming of Jesus Christ, which was through his birth in the manger in Bethlehem, it was not visible to everyone. It was not visible to everyone. When he came the first time and he was born in the manger, it's not everybody that knew about it. Not everyone knew that Jesus was born as at the time he was born. Not everybody. You know why? The wise men from the east had to search for him in Bethlehem. The wise men from the east had to search for him in Bethlehem. Can you imagine? Can you imagine when he was born? The people that were in Jerusalem didn't know that anything has happened. It wasn't a special day. It was just a day like any other day. Things were moving on. There was no special sign, but the king of kings was born. The savior of the world was born. The one who will redeem us back to God was born. The one who will alter the whole history of humanity was born. There was no noise. It was silent. The people there didn't know. Of course, he was born in the manger. So nobody would have noticed that such a great person like that was born. Even the king Herod didn't know anything. It was the wise men from the east that saw his star. And they traced him to Jerusalem. Only to be surprised that even the people in Jerusalem didn't know anything about his birth. It was that quiet. It was that private. That is his first coming. Let me show you in Matthew chapter 2. In fact, the wise men from the east had to search Jerusalem to find out what had happened. That is to tell you it wasn't a public event as at the time he was born. Nobody gave him notice. Nobody took note of it. It was just an ordinary day. Look at Matthew chapter 2. I'm reading verses 1 and 2 and verse 8. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, I want to thank God for the details of this record. Otherwise, people would have denied that he was born. It wasn't a vague record. It was a detailed, specific record. The Bible said, now when Jesus was born, number one, in Bethlehem of Judea. 
So to say he wasn't born is to deny the existence of Bethlehem of Judea. As long as there is a place called Bethlehem of Judea, nobody can deny that Jesus was born there. You see how detailed the Bible is? The Bible gave us where he was born, Bethlehem of Judea. As long as that town exists in history, then nobody can deny the birth of Jesus. Not only that, it said, in the days of what? Herod the king. Did you see that again? As long as Herod was king, sometimes in Bethlehem of Judea, so nobody can say Jesus was born. If not for this detailed record, many people would have said, well, he wasn't born. And if they could successfully deny his birth, they can rubbish his death. But the Bible has record. In the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his what? Star in the east and are come to worship him. Maybe those wise men expected that Jerusalem will be filled with noise. Jerusalem will be bubbling for the birth of a new king. They expected everywhere to be bubbling full of ceremony and all that. But when they came to Jerusalem, they discovered that it was unusually silent. So they were amazed. Where is that king born? We saw a star in the east. A king is born. And this city is as silent as this. Where is he? Born king of the Jews. For we have seen a star in the east. And I come to worship him. Now look at verse 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem. That is Herod who was king there. Because even Herod was surprised that was, is there going to be any king born apart from me? You know, he saw his position threatened. His kingdom and throne were threatened. That where is that? Is there another king that is going to be born? So, verse 8, and he sent them to Bethlehem. That is, he sent the wise men to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently. To tell you how quiet his birth was, they needed to search diligently. Hello? I'm very sure that every, every place that it was regarded as hospitals would be combed. Are you hearing me now? Unfortunately, he wasn't even born in an hospital. He wasn't born in any public health institution. And then he was, they had to search and search and say, where is that? There we are until they discover he was born in a manger. That's how quiet his first coming was. That's how unpopular his first coming was. Are you hearing me now? Not only that, the priest also had to search the Old Testament before they knew he was born in Bethlehem and before they can ascertain the assurance of his birth. Look at Matthew chapter 2. I'm reading verse 3 to 6. Matthew chapter 2 verse 3 to 6. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests, somebody said the chief priest. These are re real, re senior religious leaders. He gathered them and scribes. The scribes are the intelligentsia of those days, of the people together. He demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor, that shall rule my people Israel. Amen. So you see, there was no general knowledge of the birth of Jesus as at the time he was born. Even though his birth was announced by the angels, apart from the wise men from the east and the shepherds that were washing their flocks in the field by night, many did not know he was 
Did you get that point? That point is very, very important. However, unlike the first coming of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, brothers and sisters, it will be visible to the entire human race. Can you see the difference now? His second coming will be visible to the entire human race. His second coming is not going to be quiet. It's going to be full of mm, heavenly sound. Heavenly pomp and pageantry. He's not going to return privately. Unlike when he came the first time. That people didn't notice. The whole world. The whole human race. Will see him. That's what the Bible said in Revelation chapter 1. Let me read it again. Verse 7. Behold, a comet with clouds. Did you see that? A comet with clouds. And what? Every eye shall see him. Somebody say every eye. Say every eye. That is the difference between his first coming and his second coming. His second coming... It will be visible to the entire human race. In his first coming, the glory of Jesus Christ was veiled. But at his second coming, his glory will be evident to all men. His splendor will be evident to all men. His majesty will be evident to all men. It will not be a quiet return. It was going to be filled with the trumpet, the whole universe we know, and Jesus will appear in the sky. Are you following me now? That's the first point that I believe you should know tonight. Number two. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. According to Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, the Bible says every eye shall see him. Somebody say, every eye shall see him. And if you look at that scripture, every eye that will see him at his second coming is divided into two groups. Into how many groups? Look up everybody. Every eye will see him. But according to Revelation 1-7, every eye that will see Jesus at his second coming are divided into how many groups? Two groups. The first group, the Bible says, they also which pierced him. They also which pierced him. That's the first group of the eye that we see him. They also which pierced him. Who are the people that pierced him? This refers to the Jews who crucified him. Hello, somebody. The Jews who what? Who crucified him. The Jews who killed him, they are the group of they also which pierced him. That's the first group of the every eye that will see him. He wasn't, he wasn't killed by Africans. He was not killed by the Americans. He was not crucified by the Chinese. He was not crucified by, this, by the British people. It was not French people that killed Jesus. It was not Africans that killed him. It was not Kenyans. It was not South Africans that killed him. It was not people in Australia that killed Jesus. It was the Jews that killed him. That was why the Bible specifically referred to them as the first group of people that will see him. They also which pierced him. They also which crucified him, which killed him. They will see him when he returned as king in his glory. They, what they try to kill, they, dis, they will discover nobody can kill it. What they try to suppress, they will discover nobody can successfully suppress it. They also would pierce him. So, they also would pierce him refers to the Jews, the nation of Israel. Are you following me now? The second group of the eye that we see him, the Bible says, and all kindreds of the earth, and all kindreds of the earth. So apart from the Jews that killed him, that crucified him, all kindreds of the earth, that refers to all the Gentile nations in the world. 
who are the nations that are referred to as the Gentile nations? All other nations in the world apart from Israel. All other nations apart from Israel is referred to as the Gentile nation. Are you following me now? So anytime the Bible talks about the Gentile, it's talking about people that are not related to Israel by biology. People that have no biology blood in relation to Israel. Those who are not Israelites are referred to as the Gentile nation. The Nigerians, the Americans, the Africans, the Chinese, the Australians. I mean, the different people, all other nations apart from the Israelites are the Gentile nation. So the second group that we see him, the Bible says, all kindreds of the earth. These two groups, the Bible says, shall wail because of him. They shall mourn. They shall cry because of him. Are you following me tonight? Very, very important. That's the second point that you need to know. Every eye shall see him. They also that pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth they will wear, they will mourn because of him. Number three. What I want to do under this number three is to look at the two groups of people that will see him. You know the Bible said every eye will see him. And out of the eye that will see him, we have two groups. They also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth. So let's look at they also which what pierced him. Who are those? Who are those? I'm asking you. Who are those? The Jews. So the Jews who crucified him, they are the first group of people that will see Jesus when he returns in glory. The Jews rejected the Messiah when he came the first time. How many of you agree? How many of you agree that that's, that's what happened? The Bible said it in John chapter 1, the Gospel of St. John chapter 1, verse 12. Look at what, how the Bible puts it. Or let's start to read from verse 10. John chapter 1 from verse 10. He was in the world. And the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. Are you there with me? Verse 11. He came unto his own. Who are his own? The Israelites. The Jews. The nation of Israel. They were his own. Because Christ came to the world through them in the flesh. Christ was their blood. Christ was their relations. Christ was, their, was from them in the flesh. Are you hearing me now? He came to his own. And his own received him not. But as many as received him. Now that's not where we are going. The point is, the Israelites, the Jews, rejected the Messiah when he came at first. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Do you know that up till now, the Israelites are still waiting for Messiah? They never accept that Jesus will be the Messiah. Maybe because of the way he came. He wasn't born by a big man. He wasn't born in a palace. He was not agreeing with their religious standpoints. In fact, he was against all their religious beliefs. And as a matter of fact, it was the religious leaders that killed him. So to them, Jesus never had any form and comeliness of a Messiah. Jesus never had any, any attribute of a Messiah to them. So they never believed he was the Messiah. But beloved, that's the Messiah. So they rejected him. 
up till today they rejected him. But beloved, at his second coming, the Bible says they shall look on him whom they pierced. They shall look on him whom they pierced. They shall look on him whom they pierced. It will be surprising to them that the Jesus Christ that they killed, the Jesus Christ that they pierced, the Jesus Christ that they crucified, is eventually the Messiah. Ah, it will be surprising to them. They will be looking unto him that they pierced. Their, 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 their wonder will be, what? I am very sure they will see the sign that it was, he, it was the one that they killed. That's why the Bible said they will look, they shall look on him whom they peer. I am be, I'm believing that the signs of the nails will still be in his hand. I'm believing that all the, the scars of the uh, crown of thorns will still be there. The children of Israel will have no confusion identifying him that this is the one we pierced. And it will surprise them that could it be the Messiah? Wow. Wow. John 19, 37. That's how the Bible puts it. John chapter 19. I'm reading verse 37. John 19, 37. And again, another scripture said, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Another scripture said, they shall look on him whom they pierced. This scripture is going to be fulfilled at the second coming of Jesus. Now, John chapter 19 verse 37 was quoting Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. That's why he said, and another scripture said, John was referring to that another scripture that John was referring to is Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. Let's go back to Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. We're going to read verse 10. Are you there? Zechariah chapter 12. Are you there? I want everybody to open. See what has been prophesied in prophecy. That has alignment with what is going to happen at the second coming of Jesus. When the Jews that crucify him will see him. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. The Bible says, And I will pour upon the house of David. Did he say upon the whole world? Talk to me. Upon who? Upon the house of David. And upon the inhabitant of Jerusalem. Did he see upon the whole world? No, you see the Bible was specific. Upon the inhabitant of Jerusalem. The spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look upon me. Whom they have what? Pierced. And they shall what? Mourn. For him. As one mourneth for his own son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Look up. You know, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 says, And they that pierce him, they will wail because of him. And the Jews were the people that killed him. Although they didn't believe him as a Messiah. But by the time he returned the second time in glory, in the fullness of his glory, they will begin to wonder, what? So is the Messiah. So is the Messiah. They will identify him and they will regret what they did. They will cry. That the, ish, the reason for their own willing is they will regret their action. They will mourn their action. How did we treat him? What, what, a, what a mistake we commit. What a mistake we have committed. We didn't know it was the Messiah. Maybe we wouldn't have treated him like that. They will regret all their actions. The cruel treatment they gave to Jesus. They will wail. 
The Bible said they will wait for him as a person is waiting for his firstborn. I pray for you. I want to pray you will not suffer the loss of a child. That is not a good experience. Uh, it's very bad. It's a bad experience. Any child at all. Not to talk of the very firstborn. The Bible said they will will. They will recognize him. This is the Messiah. We killed him. We killed him. They will take the blame for killing him. They will regret killing him. How many of you remember when Jesus was standing before Pontius Pilate? And, and Pilate was trying to, you know, release Jesus. And they said, no way. No, you must kill him. You must crucify him. He said, well, which one should I release for you? Is it Jesus Christ? Or Barabbas. They say he should release Barabbas. He said, what will I do with Jesus? They say, kill him. He said, what, what offense has he committed? He has not done anything that warrants death. They say, well, if you don't kill him, you are not a friend of Caesar. You see the political undertone. And it was Caesar that appointed him as the governor of Rome. As the governor of Judah. So they wanted to set him against Caesar. They said, because anyone that says he's God is fighting against Caesar. And then he said, well, at a point, you remember, he asked for water and he washed his hand. Washed his hand. I don't know anything about it. His, in fact, his wife came at a point to talk to him that don't have a hand in the death of this man. Because I suffered a lot of things this night in the dream. And he requested for water. He washed his hand. And you know what the people of the Jews say? They say, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. When he returned the second time, they will regret that statement. They will cry. They will feel so bad. They will repent. They will be genuinely bitter about their action. They will mourn. They will wail like somebody is wailing for his firstborn. Do you understand that? That is the Jews, the nation of Israel. This prophecy, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, signified that the period for the children of Israel will be the time of grace. Do you know up till today, the nation of Israel had not believed Jesus? They had not believed Jesus. They had not believed him. They don't believe him. In fact, some people will say, well, why are you going to, why are you coming to Jerusalem? Why are you doing pilgrimage to Jerusalem? Jesus is my brother. He's my, <laughs> how did he become your savior? How did he become your God? In fact, they make jest of other nations that make holy pilgrimage to Israel. But as long as that pilgrimage is generating income for them in terms of tourism, they like it. All they are interested is not because they believe in Jesus or they value him so much because they do not take him as God. They just see him as our brother now. Are you hearing me now? And they begin to look at other people that are worshipping Jesus as God. As, I, I was wrong with you people. It was because they are blind. That was, they didn't know him. So they couldn't accept what he brought. They didn't accept him as their, as their savior. They saw him as Jesus now. So when Christ returned, they will mourn for the terrible crime of crucifying him. Brethren, for the children of Israel, it will be their time of crying. It will be their time of mourning. It will be their time of groaning and repentance. They will call upon the Lord and he will pour grace upon them. Are you with me? Look at Zechariah chapter 12. I read verse 11 to 14. Just follow me. I want you to get this truth. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 11 to 14. The Bible says, In that day, which day? When Jesus returned the second time. In that day shall there be a great morning. Where? Where? In Jerusalem. As the morning of Adadrimon 
in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall what? Shall mourn. Kill their savior. When they realize they murdered their Messiah. When their eyes open up that the Jesus they killed is their Messiah. They will regret. They will mourn. The Bible say, and they, the land shall mourn. Every family apart, family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan, their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart, the family of Shimei apart, and their wives apart, all the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. You see, it, they will mourn. That is when they will realize their mistake. They will repent that time. What will happen when they repent that time? They will mourn for the atrocities they have committed against the Lord Jesus. And listen to me, beloved. The Lord Jesus will receive them. Did you hear that? Jesus will receive them. The Lord will pardon them. The Lord will accept their repentance. Listen to me. That provision is not for you. Is only for the Jews. You are not a Jew. You are not an Eastern like. You are a, one of the Gentile nation. I'm talking about the Israelite. So the wailing of the Israelite is not a wailing that has no hope. It's a wailing of repentance. It's a wailing to realize the, the cruel death they brought upon Jesus. That time they will realize they will cry and God will accept them. How do I know? Look at Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1. Are we together? Are we still together? Jeremiah, I mean Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1. The Bible says, In that day, which day? That day when Jesus returned, there shall be a fountain. Open to, to, to the whole world. Is that what the Bible says? To where? Just to the house of David. Oh, to the house of David. And to the inhabitants of the world. Is that what the Bible says? To the inhabitants of Jerusalem. For what? For sin and for uncleanness. That fountain is the fountain of the blood of Jesus. That time it will be open to the Israelites. That time their opportunity for redemption will come. God will not be interested in sending them to hell. In their multitude. God wants to create opportunity for them to get born again. When they see Jesus in glory. They realize he is the same man we pierced, we killed. What? So is our savior. So is our messiah. They will break down in tears. They will regret all that they did against him. They will cry. They will wail. That is their own wailing. According to Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. That's their own wailing. Regretting of their past deeds. And they will cry. And there will be that fountain. Available the fountain of the blood of Jesus. They will receive and accept the fountain of the blood of Jesus. That they had rejected before. The fountain of the blood of the Lamb will cleanse them. Like it cleansed the Gentile nation that, have, that are accepting Him today. That same blood will cleanse them from all their sin. Listen to this very well. The conversion and the cleansing that the Gentile nation are experiencing now, they will experience it. Then, did you hear me now? They will experience it then. It will be their experience at that time. Say, but pastor, why are you saying this? I'm not the one that is saying it. Let's look at Zechariah. Again, chapter 13. I'll read verses 6 and 9. Zechariah chapter 13. Verse 6. And verse 9. So let's start with verse 6. Zechariah chapter 13. 
and one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. That's Jesus answering now. Did you hear that? These wounds. What are these wounds? Then we answer, these are the wounds that my friend gave me. These are the wounds that my blood brothers gave me. These are the wounds that my own people gave me. Although in ignorance, in foolishness, in blindness, in rejection, they gave me that wound. Look at verse 9. And I will bring the third part through the fire. And will refine them as silver is refined. And will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name. And I will what? And I will what? And I will hear them. I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. Did you hear that? Israel will still accept Jesus. They will still bow down to him as the Messiah. They, their eyes will still be open. God will not lead them to judgment without giving them the opportunity. The opportunity that the Gentile nation have today, God will make a provision for it for them when Christ returns. I want you to understand this. Very, very important. The Lord will give them conversion. And they will come to him mourning with mourning and tears of joy. They will come. The Israelites will come to the Lord with mourning and tears of joy. And God will accept them. But presently. What did I say? What did I say? Presently. The children of Israel are still waiting for the Messiah. <laughs> when the Messiah had come and gone. And he's coming back the second time. They're still waiting for the Messiah. They don't have the revelation that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, had come already. And as they keep waiting for Christ, as they keep waiting for the Messiah, Christ will suddenly come in the glory of the Father. At that time, they will see him and they will recognize him. Did you hear that? So, it's not going to be a hopeless situation for the children of Israel. The people through whom Jesus came in the flesh, God will give them what appears to me as a special consideration. When they see him, when he comes back, they will recognize him. This is what they will say. Isaiah chapter 25. Now, if these things are not written in the Bible, a lot of people will say, no, that's not going to happen. A lot of people will say, well, is God partial? God is not partial. That's his own program. He said, but why will God give them extra chance? At least when Jesus appears, it should be judgment for everybody. I'm not God. When you see God, you ask him. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. I'm only teaching you the Bible. What the Bible says. Because people would have said, well, God would have given them a level playing field at least. They have rejected Jesus. They never accepted him and all that. So by the time Jesus returned the second time, it should be the time of judgment for them and all that. Now, brothers and sisters, when you see God, you can take it off with him as a case. But this is the scripture. Now, would you have allowed your own people to go to hell without giving them a chance? Knowing that they were religious, knowing that they were in blindness. Well, I don't know how it happens like that, but that's the will of God. That's the plan of God. And I believe God can never be wrong. This is what they will say. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 9. And it shall be said in that day. Can you take note of this word in that day? In that day. These are prophetic of the day of the second coming of Jesus. That season when Jesus returned. In that day. Lo, this is our God. They will acknowledge Jesus as their God. That time is coming. 
we, we have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. They will accept him as their Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Listen to me, brethren. That is for the Israelites. But now, the Gentiles are receiving the Lord. Who are the Gentiles? All other nations, apart from the nation of Israel, today are receiving the Lord. How many of you know that majority of the Christians in the world today are from among the Gentile nation? How many of you know that? The majority of the Christians in the world today are from the Gentile nation. Most of the Israelites are not Christians. They don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. But beloved, their own time will come. But now, somebody say now, it is the time of the Gentiles. It is our own opportunity. The Gentiles are receiving the Lord. The Gentiles are getting saved, are getting born again. Listen to me. This is our time. This is our chance. As one of the Gentile people, this is our time to get born again. This is our time to receive Jesus. Don't say when Jesus comes, I will recognize him. That provision is not for you. That provision is only for the Israelite. So if you don't accept him now today, your own willing will be hopeless willing. Because the Bible says, they that pierce him, and then all the kindreds of them, the two of them will wail. But the wailing will be different. The Israelites will wail for their crime. They will cry, they will mourn, and God will accept them. They will identify him as their Savior and Lord, and God will accept them. But the Gentile that should have received Jesus now, by that time, they would have missed their chances. They would have missed their opportunity. This is still our time. Did you hear me now? Whatever you want to do with Jesus, please do it now. Otherwise, it will be too late when he returns. This is our time. This is the time of reconciliation for the Gentile. This is the time of repentance. This is the accepted time that the Lord is ready to accept the Gentile nation. It is the time for everybody in the world to receive Jesus. But we must not be ignorant of the limitation of this period of repentance and reconciliation. What do I mean by limitation? This time will not last forever. It will soon end. After which the Lord will Turn to the Israelites. This is our chance. When our own chance is exhausted and Jesus returns, it will be the chance of the Israelite. Did you get what I'm saying? To any Gentile, that time, it is late already. This is your time. Don't joke with salvation today. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. Don't come to church and think we are just playing religion. You better have a personal relationship with Jesus today. And those who are born again, this is the time to serve him acceptably. Serve him with honesty. Serve him with patience. Let the purpose of Jesus prosper in your hand. This is the time to work for the reward you will get that day. This is our time as Gentiles. Don't lose this chance because once this time is over, God will turn to the Israelite. It will be their chance. He said, but pastor, did you know this? Look at what Paul said in Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. I tell people, you cannot stay in your house and read the Bible alone and understand. We need a fellowship together under the calling and the power of the Holy Ghost to understand these details. Romans chapter 11. I want everybody to open and let's read verse 25. Romans chapter 11 verse 25. 
For I will not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentile become in. Do you understand that statement? Hello? Blindness is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be coming. Do you understand that statement? They never accepted Jesus as the Messiah. They came under the force of the spirit of blindness. That was what gave a redemptive opportunity for the Gentiles. And you can align it with what the Bible said in John chapter 1 verse 11. That he came to his own. His own did not accept him. But as many as received him. Their rejection of Jesus gave us our redemptive opportunity. You say, but what if they have accepted Jesus? What would have happened? Well, I don't know. But all I know is what I will tell you. The fact that they rejected Jesus gave us a redemptive opportunity. Are you hearing me now? And as long as they keep rejecting Jesus, up till today, our time of repentance is still in force. The nations of the Gentiles can receive Jesus, can accept Jesus, and be the same commonwealth of Israel, and share in the covenant of promise, and still be liable or have access to the blessings of Abraham. Are you hearing me now? As long as blindness is happening to them, it is our own time. But beloved, there will be fullness of the Gentile. That is, this time will soon expire. That time, it will be their time. That time, their eyes will open. Did you get that? Praise God. After the return of Christ. I want you to put your hand in Romans chapter 11. I'm still going to go there. After the return of Christ, the spiritual blindness of the Jews will be taken away because that will be the time of the fulfillment of the promise of God for them. When Jesus returns and they realize he's the Messiah, their blindness will go. Are you hearing me now? By that time, it will be their turn to receive the fulfillment of the promise of God. Look at Romans chapter 11. I'll read verses 26 and 27. Let me read it from verse 25 so that you can see the flow. How many of you are in Romans now? Huh? Chapter 11. Let me start to read from verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye would be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be coming, until all the Gentiles has exhausted the opportunity for redemption. Blindness is happened to Israel. Now look at verse 26. And so, all Israel shall be what? Shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away on godliness from Jacob. For what? This is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sin. Is this clear? Do you understand this program of God? So when you read Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, you should know what the Bible is saying. Say, behold, he cometh with clouds. And all I shall see him. They that pierce him. The Jews. And all the kindreds of the earth. The two of them shall wail. Because of him. But it's not the same reason for wailing. And it doesn't produce the same thing. The wailing of the Israelite. Is the wailing of repentance. Is the wailing of regret. 
the blindness of their eyes will have been lifted. They will, they will see the evil of their doing. They will wait, they will repent. They will truly acknowledge Jesus as their Savior and Lord and God will forgive them. God will give them that chance. But that is not the time of repentance for the Gentile nation. For all the Gentile nation, this is our own time. This is our own time. Let me take number four as we pray tonight. The second group of people recorded by Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 that we see Jesus are all kindreds of the earth. All kindreds of the earth. The Gentile nations. This is the second group that we see Jesus Christ when he comes again. Those that didn't accept Jesus and did not make the rapture, they will cry because of the terrible sins they will see and they will suffer. Beloved, when Jesus appeared in the sky, those of us who are of the Gentile nation that have accepted him as our Lord and Savior, that are born again, and that are faithful to him, we will be raptured with him. But many, many of the Gentiles will still be here who were not qualified for rapture. Those fake Christians, those unfaithful believers, those who are joking now in the church, that time they will miss the rapture. They will be together with all the people that didn't even accept him at all. They are the Gentile nation. Their own chance is already exhausted. There is no door of salvation opening for them again. It is time for judgment. By that time, the church will have been taken out. The people of God will have been raptured. So nothing will stop the full wrath of God from being unleashed. I am praying that by that time, you will not be here. By that time, I will not be here. Anyone that is not listening to what I'm teaching today will be the pastor of the people that remain that time. That time, you will do Bible study for them. <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> that time, you will do Bible study for them. You say, ah, we are sorry. <laughs> if we had known, we would have listened to what daddy used to tell us. Because that time, I won't be here. Me, I will be here. What about you? I would have gone with the rapture. I would have gone with the rapture. Those people that are, that are hypocritical now, that are not born again, those that are indulging in secret sin, wasting their own chance at repentance, that time, because they already know what the Bible says. It's just that they didn't accept him. They, they are not faithful. They know the Bible. They know the word of God. Many of them are workers in the church. Many of them are pastors, leading people. But they are not faithful to Jesus. They will know that rapture has happened. That time they will be the one talking to people. They will take this series of lessons. They will go to YouTube to go and listen to it. Ah! So it happened. Ah! Ah! Daddy said it. All the other pastors said it. Ah! We are finished. We missed the rapture. That time, I will not be here that time. I, I, I will release this church for them. Let them continue to do whatever they do with it. Are you with me? Are you with me? Brothers and sisters, don't miss the rapture. This is your only opportunity. Don't miss the rapture. Those that are still here, that have not given their life to Jesus, they will wail. They will cry. They will mourn. Because of the terrible things they will see and the terrible things they will suffer. The Lord will come with thousands of saints to judge the world. And he will split the nations into two. We will have the sheep the sheep are the Christians who believed and served the Lord till the end of their lives. That's the group you should be. They are the Christians who believed and served the Lord till the end of their life. And then the second group are the goats. 
Don't be in the group of the goat. The goat are the stubborn people. The rebellious sinners. Those who will say, let, if the pastor like, let him, be, let, let him be preaching fire, I will not accept. Those who will say, well, let them continue to talk. What I will do is what I will do. They are the goat. They are the one who despise Jesus' redemptive death. They are the one who live their life the way they like. They are the one who serve pleasure. They shall wail at his glorious return. Don't be in that group. Brothers and sisters, as I conclude tonight, the second coming of Jesus Christ will mean doom and terrible judgment for the unrepentant and the hardened sinner. But for the Christians, it will be joy. It will be gladness. Brethren, between gladness and gloominess, which one are you choosing to be your experience when Jesus returns? Which one are you choosing? Are you choosing gladness? If you are choosing gladness, then it means you must give your life to Jesus. And then you must serve him faithfully. Serve him honestly. Serve him with all your strength. Let the will of God prosper in your hand. Let the assignment of the kingdom prosper in your hand. Serve him for the reward that he will give you. He says, behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give unto them according to their works. Beloved, if you are born again, it's time for service. This period will not last forever. It is our only chance. Let's serve him. Let's work for reward. Let's work for reward. Let's be honest. Let's be faithful. Let's be consistent. Let's be passionate about the interest of the kingdom. Those who reject him, and they are the Gentile. Those who reject him today, beloved, their time will be over. It will be the time of gloominess, the time of sadness. Let's rise up on our feet. One thing that I believe should be a take-home take truth, a take-home truth tonight, is for you to take this chance that you have, this period that we have, this opportunity that you have to accept him and to serve him. I'm praying you will not miss this chance. I'm praying you will not waste this opportunity. Are you hearing me? I want you to tell the Lord, I will not miss this chance. I will not waste this opportunity. There are two groups of people here tonight. Or probably two groups of people listening to me online. Those that are not born again. Again, the Lord is calling you tonight. The window of repentance is still open. The door of mercy is still open. This is a new year. The call to repentance has come again. We do not accept it. Why there is still opportunity? Would you still shut the door of your heart? Are you not convinced that this thing is true? Or you think it is just a religious teaching? Brethren, we are at the tail end of the world. The program of God is going to the end. Give your life to Jesus today. If you have never been serious with him, this is the time to give your life to Jesus. Don't don't, don't just come to church just, well, I just come. No, no, no. Have a personal encounter with Jesus tonight. Turn a new leaf. Let this year be the beginning of your salvation experience. Don't pretend about it. Because this chance will soon be over. That's the first group. The second group are the people that are already born again. If you are already born again, this is your time to serve the Lord. Don't let anything stop you from serving. Don't allow any excuse to stop you from serving. 
at your level. Be serious. Serve faithfully. Don't say you are a believer and you are not serving him. We serve for reward. He is coming soon. And he is coming with reward. I pray you will not miss your reward. In the name of Jesus. Whichever group you belong to. Let's go before the Lord. And begin to pray. I will not miss this opportunity. I will not miss this opportunity. For those of us who are born again. I choose to serve you. Faithfully. Passionately. Consistently. As from today. More than ever before. More than I did last year. There shall be no slowing down. I shall be passionate. Serving the Lord. The will of God will prosper in my hand. The pleasure of the Lord will prosper in my hand. The purpose of God will prosper in my hand. I shall not allow anything to stop me from faithful, selfless service of God, of Jesus in the kingdom. I shall win soul. I shall win soul. Open your mouth and pray. I shall win soul. I shall tell others about Jesus. I shall bring people to Jesus. I shall serve and work for the salvation of other people. That's for those of us that are born again. I will not allow anything in the flesh to slow me down. I will not allow my problem to make me lose sight of my purpose. I will be consistent in my work with the Lord. Those that are not born again, it's your time. It's your day. Give your life to Jesus. Let's open our mouth and pray tonight.